I'm Jim Clark, Visual Arts Manager at Hopkins Center for the Arts. We have a treat today. We are on site at the uh, Marianne and Gary Carlson compound. I'll call it a compound. I hope that's okay. That's fine. Uh, and we're going to be speaking uh, in support of their exhibition, A Confluence of Objects, on view in the Red Penning Gallery through July 29th, 2023. Um, Marianne and Gary, this is the point where I'd welcome you. But you're supposed to welcome me, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> welcome you and welcome, welcome everyone. Welcome the audience here. Thank you so much for inviting us in uh, to the, the inner world. Um, this is both your homestead and your working space, right? You have Correct. a studio yeah. on site, um, as well as the whole property is studded uh, with incredible art objects. Um, can you tell us what? What do you refer to or call yourself or your process? Um, I mean, I, I have a term in mind, but I'm not sure that it's how you would self-identify. What, what do you call what you do? Um, probably mixed media assemblage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Sculpture. We used to just say there. found object assemblage sculpture, but now we're, we also work in objects into our, our uh, are creations that have to do with that we actually make from scratch. Um, for instance, there's a piece at the uh, Hopkins Gallery that has ravens in it, and I wanted to present kind of a contrast between a mechanical looking uh, raven and a realistic one. So I didn't have a, a, a realistic raven, so I carved one on a basswood and uh, applied some sculpture material over that to create my own realistic uh, representational looking. So, yeah, we, I think your description is probably... Right, and uh, the piece that Gary had at the um, Arts North, the ship, Yeah. that piece, um, a lot of people look at it and think that the ship is something he found, mm -hmm. but that was all constructed so I think we've started using mixed media more because yeah. found object kind of... It could lead it, people It serves down. us a disper yeah. uh, disservice. Disservice, yeah. 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 So, uh, in, Is that a more recent development in your practice? Um, it is. It yeah. is, yeah. 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 We used to just do found object and... Well, and I've done I've done representational looking wood sculptures in the past. Sure. Um, but you know I'm not uh, keen on sanding, so I <laughs> kind of drifted away. Uh. Did that predate your your current practice? It actually predated my uh, my making sculpture. I was a sure. drawing painting artist all of my life from the time I was um, you know yay high. Uh, thanks to mom, taught me how to draw. But uh, when I retired from uh, being an art teacher, uh, I in, in 03, I thought that I'd be drawing and painting and doing photography. Those were my three loves that I'd, all my life. And that's why we built the the art barn, and there's a studio up on the top of that that we could take the gallery or you guys do with that. But um, that's where I thought I'd be spending all my time. And wow. uh, in 03, uh, Mary Ann was making sculptures, assemblage sculptures, and, and uh, I thought she looked like she was having fun. And when she was at, I retired before she did, and when she was at work, I appropriated a couple of her pieces and made something. I thought she'd be happy about it. But... <laughs> wow. When you hunt for pieces, <laughs> yeah, you have a... A stash or, oh. Oh, sorry. We have a, yeah, well, we have... You know, you have a heart connection to them. Yeah. yeah. You know? And then when somebody pilfers them off your bench. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's kind of a harsh word. <laughs> <laughs> How would you characterize it? <laughs> well, I, let me put it this way. I felt bad for, for a little bit. <laughs> but it was, I found out that it was fun. Sure. And it I was, was uh, my dad was an iron worker. His dad was an iron worker. My dad built his own house in North Minneapolis. And I grew up around people that knew how to work with tools and, and worked with their hands. And my brother was like that. And uh, um, I just find it interesting that maybe, I didn't realize I was like that, but 
you know, something about genetics, maybe. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Or what I grew up with. Yeah, so. Yeah. And so the sculptural practice for you, Gary, is uh, you've been doing about 20 years now. But, uh, before that, and it was, before that, it was 2D pursuits. Yeah. Yeah. Did you find it a stretch to, to go into 3D? Um, um, no, for some reason, it, uh, I took to it right away. But a lot of the stuff that I was making was a, a bas relief or a high relief. Okay. So it was, they were wall pieces, and now I've been doing, you know, sculpture in the round and sure. doing other things. But when I look back at some of my, if, when we're upstairs here, I can show you, but I always had a fascination with how negative space related to positive space and the interaction of those two. And when I look at, at my early drawings, even my earliest drawings, it was, I was working space into the pieces, mm -hmm. not unlike what I'm doing with my, especially the sculpture in the round, if, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. It does, it does. Yeah. And Marianne, uh, Gary got this inspiration for the yeah. 3D from you, so your practice was yeah. uh, already uh, in place, and how long had you been doing uh, the mixed media Awesome um, probably since college. Really? Okay. I was introduced to um, Joseph Cornell's work, yeah. the box um, collages. And um, I also, uh, my first intent when I went to college was to be a jeweler. And um, that didn't work out. And the collage and the jewelry, that's where I started. Mm -hmm making, you know, like small little sculptures, pins to wear. And um, then from there, they just, I thought, you know, it takes a long time to make this little tiny sculpture. And then I could be making it this big and selling it for something more than $20. Sure, sure. <laughs> you know, so. Um, she was putting a lot, of, a lot of time into these things, too. She was carving interesting looking faces in rocks and uh, it was just some marvelous mini sculptures that she was making. Well and is there a piece in the show right now with some carved, a face carved into the rock? Um, Probably. Yeah, yeah. And so it, it's playing on right. that practice and imagery from earlier? Right, yeah. right. And oftentimes I'll use pieces um, that like I made them in college, but you know, when you're young <laughs> and you're just learning a technique, how um, you don't, maybe you don't have like a, a whole finished idea in mind, or I don't know, maybe, you know, life has matured me and uh, now I see it in a different light. And so I'll take some of those pieces and rework them and put them in, sure. whatnot. Sure. Yeah. So um, there are several pieces that I've done that with. There's some you, that so mentioning that. of working mm -hmm. past work into you know, assemblage, mm -hmm. current assemblage. I've been doing some of that too, where I've been, as an art teacher, I was doing, for instance, porcelain um, clay sculpture projects with the kids, with seventh mm -hmm. graders, and I would. Um, lay out a, a, a project and they'd watch me I'd they'd watch me do 15 minutes uh, an hour of uh, work during the day or during an hour and then I'd do that the next hour and by the end of the day I'd have a finished project a finished thing that they could see the next day nice. and uh, uh, I found and, and then I would store them and forget them I didn't I fired them so that they were white and and, and less fragile but um, then uh, Mary Ann said, well, maybe you should do something with those. And I looked at them and thought, they w maybe they would work with some of the current assemblage things that, uh, that I've been doing. So I mm -hmm. painted them up and worked them in. And I think there's a, one or two of them, maybe at least one of them down in the Hopkins show of a fish that's uh, oh, yeah. into a sculpture. Yeah. Process-wise, um, I'm curious if... Um, it seems like it would be mm, just about impossible to preconceive or pre-visualize what you want one of these things to look at, like at the end. Like, 
is, I would imagine, you can't go in and say, well, I'm going to make this, and then you go find the parts to fit that, but rather it is responsive, that you find maybe a core piece mm -hmm. that uh, serves as an inspiration, and then you work off of that. But um, it's entirely possible I'm wrong about that. Can no, you tell us no. about how that works? Because like with, with your drawing practice, many draftspeople or, or painters, I mean, they have an idea what they want it to look like when it's done. Can you talk about process? Yeah, we don't do many thumbnail sketches in terms of working out composition and how... Well, you don't. Well, no. our, yeah. the genesis... <laughs> the, I do. The genesis of my work is substantially different than what how Marianne approaches the process. In her situation, I'll let her talk about it. She, she works with a, a narrative initially, and she can, and she does kind of set out pieces that, that speak to that. Now, I'm very reactive, um, uh, kind of how I lead my, my life, you know. I, I find a piece that I think is interesting to look at. It's that whole idea that the ordinary is extraordinary. If you really, if you really train your eyes and look at the lines and the shapes and the colors and the subtle textures, and etc. But but you can take an object that looks interesting and then you react to that. To You go out into your junk pile and you find something that, that's akin to that in terms of color or something. Mm -hmm. Even though it's a disparate object in terms of its function, its past function, you find something uh, that's, that looks like it would play well together with that, that particular piece and then you arrange it, and then you go, you stare at it for 15 minutes. <laughs> Watching me work would be really boring. You, know? <laughs> you stare at it, ah, I don't know. <laughs> and then I go find another piece, and I put that down and move it around a little bit, and that again plays well with the other pieces. And then eventually, it might tell me what it wants to be, um, a week or two later, and it might be something that communicates a, a feeling, a mood, an emotion, uh, some kind of a, a social comment. Um, but it doesn't, it, it's like fishing. You never know what you're going to catch, what's under the surface. And mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of exciting that way, not knowing where it's going to lead you to. Um, and, event, and, and sometimes it just turns out to be a non-objective piece that's meant to be enjoyed for composition. My whole, my whole thing is I try to put some sort of visual order to all this visual chaos that's happening around us every day. And, uh, and if I can make something speak to somebody, then I'm pretty happy about it. But your, your way of working is you should explain that. Well... Um... Later on in my shop, you'll see I've got um, a doll form that I've had for a number of years and been thinking about kind of what I want. And her pose is pretty static, but she has kind of a ballerina pose to her, you know, so I've been thinking, what can I do? And also, she doesn't have a head. So, can I just insert something at this point? <laughs> <laughs> she would put that up in our bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> it sat I can't around. go to sleep with that thing. <laughs> <laughs> it sat around for a long time. And anyway, so finally it's been moved there. But I've done a lot of sketches as to what I am going to do with it, mm. you know, and do I want to put a person's head on it? Do I want to put a rabbit head, a fox head? You know, I've started a couple of different things. And then also that then led me to um, trying new material, um, sculpting with porcelain air dry clay. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of slowed me up a little bit too. Sure. So anyway. But I do a lot of sketches before I kind of figure out exactly what I want to do. Not on all of them, but on a lot of them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I do. That's so. fantastic how uh, disparate your uh, strategies are to, to working. Um, and I don't know that it's that apparent um, 
when you look at them, though you both definitely have uh, unique and personal languages, um, and you can see that. Uh, even the show is just ripe with objects. I mean, it is, yeah. it is a dense, a wonderfully dense show. Um, but you can, if you spend enough time in there, you can say, without looking at the label, that's Mary Ann's work, yeah. that's Gary's work, um, mm -hmm. which is fantastic. Yeah. So uh, a painter, um, there's a lot of different ways that a painter um, chooses to organize their palette. Right, um, and there's folks that use a certain um, set of pigments, and they always arrange them on, in such a way. Um, with your um, medium choices, how do you possibly organize the work or choose? Like, do you, um, there's so they seem to be sourced from so many different spots. I just can't imagine how you would say, "Oh, this needs this." How does that work? I mean, do you organize them by color or size, or is there no organization and you're picking through? If you're speaking to organization, I'm going to let Marianne. <laughs> <laughs> so I have bins of um, toys. Mm -hmm. I have bins of wobbler wheels. I have bins of wobbler parts. I have bins of croquet balls and pool balls and just wooden balls, sure. you know, just, so it's a little of everything. Mm -hmm. um, it just depends on how it's used, I guess. Sure. But, you know, every now and then he'll go digging through my stuff and uh, I'll say, no, <laughs> no, 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 you can't be, a, th those are wobbler parts. I've been saving those for wobblers, you sure, know. Sure. But it'll look so good here. Uh, and um, That's that, what Gary says? Yeah, or, yeah. yeah, right. So <laughs> the snowy owl only has one ball claw foot. Mm. And the All other right. one I made okay. to match it. I took the other one. Because <laughs> he took the other one. <laughs> Actually, I had three of them, and he has taken two to put in sculptures. Wait, you're keeping track? Yes. <laughs> Because I had two, and then you took one. Then I found another one, now I had two, and then you took I'm one. I'm expecting during this interview that she suggests that I revisit drawing. <laughs> <laughs> and why not? It is the king of all the arts. It is. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. So. Um, so in addition to your exhibition... Uh, with us, uh, you have a show at the Phipps going essentially the same time. It opened right. last weekend, right? Um, right. How in the world can you keep track of it all? Yeah. That's my job. Yeah. Again, because I'm the organizer. Mm -hmm. um, I also do all the Photoshop work. Okay. So Gary's expertise with the cameras, you know, he yeah. can he can take the picture and make it look pretty good and then I can fix it or tweak it in Photoshop mm -hmm. and um, I'm also the organizational part you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, do that all in word that's awesome <laughs> we were driving back from uh, a trip up north and saw a great big billboard with one of your works on it, Marianne, and it was for yep. uh, the Hallberg Center in Wyoming. Right. So you've also recently had a show there as well. Gary had a show there a couple of years ago. Okay. Um, they have, uh, I'm on the board there. Okay. So um, I can't enter in their competitions. Unfortunately, yeah. but oftentimes I show because sure. they have a lower level area um, where they do the refreshments and stuff like that. And then they do like the judges art and board mm -hmm. members art down there. So um, most of the time I have a piece down there during that time. But awesome. Interesting little thing about her billboard. Yeah. Is that you know, raining? Yeah. No. Wow. Prinkle, prinkle. No kidding. Um, raining. Sun shower. Yeah. The uh, um, I had a a piece that was in the state fair show that the uh, 
arts writer for the uh, Tribune put in the, in the variety section. And I showed that to my family because I was real proud of that. And, and uh, then Marianne uh, came up with this, and they put her piece on this billboard. And our grandson, Zach, said, uh, <clears throat> you know, Grandpa, yours, that's nice that you had something in the newspaper, but nobody reads the newspaper anymore. <laughs> but everybody sees billboards. <laughs> <laughs> So family has a way of actually kind of keeping you in place. Yeah. Isn't that the truth? Yeah. 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 Uh, and that brings me, so uh, we talked about the show we have in the show at the Phipps and that you'll show at uh, Halberg. Where else might uh, folks see your work? Well, I've got a, uh, I, I do have the, uh, that, that ship that was at, the, yeah. at Hopkins. That's in that. Uh, the members show over there right now. Oh, okay, anyway. But uh, we've got a, a, a website. Gary and Marianne Carlson dot Weebly dot com. All right. And then next, uh, we have one more show planned that we know of, and that's next summer we have a, uh, a duo show at the, uh, uh, the Duluth Art Institute. Dynamite. And when does that open to you? Sometime in July. They haven't given me a... Okay. They haven't nailed down a perfect date. Sure. It's going to be early July through the end of September. Fantastic. So, there is another of, possible show. show that they're talking about at, uh, what was the name of it? Oh, at McCrosty in Grand, in Grand Rapids. Grand Rapids, yeah. 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 Awesome. Well, let's open it to questions uh, from our Hopkins Center for the Arts member audience here. So each of your practices are an individual practice. Do you ever collaborate on a piece? Yes. Yeah. Um, oftentimes, most of the time, I will find pieces that I think, while I'm looking through pieces for my work, I'll see something that might go with Gary's piece, you know, so I'll just take it and set it on his bench with all the rest of the stuff that he's pulling from. Or sometimes I might actually put it in his sculpture. You know, like, this would be cool here. She's good. Once in a while. <laughs> once I didn't a while, think of that. Once in a while, I move stuff around, and he, he'll say, I already tried that. <laughs> <laughs> but, she, yeah. But, we, and he does the same for me. So as he's working, you know, he'll say, oh, this seems like it can go in that sculpture. But so. we have done collaborative pieces that that was our, our goal. Mm. Um, but like we don't do a lot up. of them, but. From uh, from, yeah, from, from the ground, from the very beginning, and okay. and we, it's a funny thing though. The the flavor of the finished piece always ends up looking a little bit like her style. Yeah. I don't know how that would oh. work, but uh, she's the organizer. Yeah, and <laughs> and then it's also a lot heavier if Gary helps me with it. I tend because to use large. Uh, he uses a lot of. Big bulky farm equipment stuff. A lot of the farm, yeah, stuff that I found Iron. when I'm when I'm digging up boulders to do rockscaping around here, a lot of iron comes up on the property. Uh, this was homesteaded. Uh, we've got an abstract that goes back to the 1860s, the mid 1860s. So it's one of the early early farms uh, in in this area or in Minnesota, and uh, so that there's stuff. And this was a farmhouse that was on the property that was bulldozed by the prior owner and and the barns and everything and so there's all kinds of stuff under the mm -hmm. under the ground that keeps popping up that I tend to look at and think oh, that's an interesting looking rusted piece that might be you know and sure. but they tend to be heavier uh, heavier pieces so uh, sure in those works that that you were collaboratively from the ground up, you you build both of your names on them, but some of the, but just about everything. There's a little bit of hey, what do you think of this? And there's, oh yeah, we're uh, we're always it's nice to to be able to share a a, a studio that mm -hmm. with somebody that uh, knows uh, uh, visual order mm. and can you know it's, it's an it's a my process, I'm sure hers is too, to a large degree, my process is intuitive. And I keep working, and intuition works for me most of the time, but sometimes I, I spin my wheels, and uh, then I have to go back to the, the left brain and, and think about 
you know the you know some of the uh, some of the principles of design that I that maybe I failed on something but it's nice to be able to turn to her and just say hey what do you think about this and then she'll look at it and it's just like a little bit like magic with her intuition because she'll she'll look at it for a while and then she'll walk into the other room where we have a lot of stuff stored and uh, I'll hear rattling of things in there and she'll come back and put it right there and I look at it and think most of the time I'll look at it and think yeah that that really works so it's huh. it's a really a, a plus for and we do it for each other uh, so that there's not hardly one piece that doesn't have a little tweak in it somewhere or other or a suggestion by the other. So, Oftentimes, you know, when you talk about it with somebody, it helps you to organize in your brain where you're going and what you want and what you don't want. And so, um, and also, I think it helps us work a little faster too. Sure. Because... You know, maybe I will have eventually got there, yeah. but it might have taken me a lot longer because I didn't see it as fast as he did because I didn't step back, you know. Mm -hmm. So um, it's really nice to have that second perspective on what you're working on. Mm -hmm. And also, like, in attaching pieces, mm -hmm. you know, um, he'll ask, what's the best way to do this? And I'll ask him, can you do this? I can't, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> kind of a thing. But I can use most of the tools. Well, and that, that's a, it brings up a great point that you're not uh, E6000ing and super gluing stuff. Uh, the, no. the attachment schemes on your work is really um, strong. I mean, it's, it's, it's mechanical connections and uh, can you speak to... Uh... We, we don't trust glues, although we do use them on occasionally when there's a, a light something that, that can't be aesthetically... It won't look right if we use a heavier mechanical, but everything is riveted, um, screwed, bolted, wired, um, metal folded over something. There's all kinds of creative... Soldered. ...ways mm -hmm. of, of solving an attachment issue. And then sometimes, because I'm basically paranoid, uh, sometimes I'll, besides the mechanical way, I'll put E6000 on it or JB Weld as a secondary. And then sometimes if I put JB Weld on it, for instance, I might even line around that with E6000, you know, yeah. so on the yeah. back. Belt and suspenders, someplace. redundancy, yes. to, yes. to ensure <laughs> yes. that it's uh, the longevity. Right. Yes. I mean, it, it, yeah. It's pride right. in the object. Right. Well, you know. and that's one of the things I like about, that fascinates me about art. Uh, something that will live beyond, we're just here for a brief amount of time, unfortunately. I'm not talking about the mothership, <laughs> but I am, I guess I am. But we're only around for a little bit, and it's nice to have things that last beyond you. And even though realistically a small percentage of art lasts over the centuries, I still like the idea of, of that, of uh, something living beyond. So, so they don't know how long really glue is going to last. Mm -hmm. And you've got a fighting chance if you're using a mechanical mm -hmm. uh, aspect. Uh, we, if something is that I've got that's heavy uh, requires something other than what I just talked about, I've got a, a really a good neighbor over on the 15 acres next to me that's got a welder, and he's pretty good at using that. And uh, so I, I'll ask him to occasionally. But I usually I don't like to weld because sometimes it spoils the um, you know, some of the the coloration or the mm. texture. Um, sure. Yeah, it can uh, mess up your patina. Yep, totally. that's the word. <laughs> totally. Okay, I have two questions. First of all, how many items or works do you have in progress at any one time? And the second question is, where do you like to go to find all your parts and bits and pieces and Good supplies? Question. Um, most of the time we have a number of pieces going at once um, because when I'm looking for the, you know, the piece that I'm focusing on right now, I'll see something and then I'll, it's like, oh, this and this and this will go together. That's going to go over there. That'll be something, you know. 
Um, and so I've, and then on my, I've got a jewelry bench and there's bunches of stuff on there as well. You know, if Gary cuts off a tiny little piece of something, you know, he'll say, I, I bet you could use this, you know, so he'll put it over on the jewelry bench and then I've got something going on over there. So, I don't know, some, it's usually one piece that we're concentrating on, but we might have two or three. Like, he's had a guitar piece laying on the floor in the bench two in years. the studio oh. for two years. And, uh, pieces we, for it. So yeah, can't, can't it's, it's laying there and there are other pieces laying have around. To feel and he keeps inspired in rearranging it. And so it, it hasn't looked interesting enough to move from the floor no. to the workbench. So but a lot of the things that, I mean, if there are things that we find on the property, we'll use those. For instance, there's some big metal parts that I put on. I don't know if you saw the sculpture of the pig that's yeah, yeah. over there. Uh, some of those parts came off of the property, but um, we'll go to flea markets, garage sales. <laughs> Friends are, I've got a whole truck load of stuff that we got from a friend here a few days ago that wants us to do a commission. And she was getting rid of all kinds of stuff that she thought maybe we might be able to use for the piece that we're going to do her. Uh, but we've got a lot, now that people know what we're doing, we'll get call. I suspect some of these I'm starting to suspect that they want us to clean out their garage. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, but, yeah. Uh, and she's, she stopped the car and made me get out in traffic to recover a rusted something in the, in the, along the road there, but she might have an ulterior motive there. I don't know. <laughs> so. She took my favorite question, which is where you get the stuff. Um, but I look at your pieces and they're just so fascinating to me. I'm, I'm a collector and very haphazard in my work style, always have been. Haven't been an artist for very long. But when you assemble things, there's so many different pieces that go together. How do you have the vision that that's going to happen? Uh, you know, you stare at it. I'd like to see a time lapse of your staring for 15 minutes, <laughs> compressed over how the piece evolves and how oh, you add yeah, things to it. That yeah. would be fascinating. I, I think... Um, and that's for both of you, actually. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, I think that, um, you know, I, I try to work a little bit every day. I don't always get there because mm. I am the one that does the organizing and... I'm the one that does all the applications for shows and all that kind of stuff, you know. So all that takes time away from your time in the shop. Right. So he's pretty spoiled when it comes I to I appreciate that. you. Though. <laughs> you do. You yeah. do. And, um, but, yeah, it does take a while. And I don't know, like I said, it you work on it here, you work on it there, and then well, for me, does throw some things in I, and... I started working on a blueprint for um, for composition when I was in college, and uh, I started to. And if you practice something all the time, you put in your you know ten thousand plus hours, which I've at seventy six years old I've put in, you know close to close to sixty years of, of practicing composition and how it can be used, and how I can do an asymmetrically balanced piece by balancing this massive, darker, all this stuff over here with just a bright color, for instance, over here, mm -hmm. and how that can balance, and, or how I can use uh, a repetition to create rhythm, and how rhythm can, can uh, in a pleasant kind of a way, lead your eye around a piece, to, and, and not off of the piece, to where you want to go, maybe in terms of a focal point or a center of interest. So, and, and there's, there's, and I taught, when I taught 34 years of, uh, of art education to kids in, in the Moundsview district, I would do several weeks of compositional uh, awareness or, mm -hmm. and, and drawing, uh, you know, uh, actually looking and seeing what, what's in front of you rather than what you think something looks at. But, you know, so composition has 
is ingrained in me at this point, and I can just uh, flip the switch, go into the right brain, and just just work without using a lot of words. I'll just in, sure. and it intuitively, and usually the intuition tells me when to stop, but sometimes it doesn't, and that's the hardest thing I think for a lot of artists to reckon with. They a lot of people, even really good artists, sometimes don't know when to when to stand back from their piece. Sometimes less is more, and sometimes if you if you labor over something and and uh, and work it that way, you end up with maybe a stiffer looking, stiffer feeling uh, to the piece, and not as, and maybe some of the energy is is sucked out of that. If that sure. makes sense. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I've done that, so I'm... <laughs> yeah, I mean, oh, we all have. We all have. Right, and that's yeah. why it's nice to have somebody who knows your process in the shop with you because, you know, he'll be looking for a piece to put there, and, and I'll say, you don't need that. You know, it's... You just don't need it. Oh, and, oh she'll stop me mid-hand. I'll have my hand out, and she'll go, no! <laughs> <laughs> don't do it! <laughs> Are you available for hire? For yeah. <laughs> Stop yeah. already. Yeah. Yeah, I think all artists. Uh, yeah, and since we're going to get a tour later, I'm also fascinated at what tools you use. I'm fascinated by tools just in general. but He has all of them. No, no. You always need more tools. <laughs> I, I second that. <laughs> I, 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 a cutoff, a metal cutoff, tool has become very useful for me because I'm, I'm not surprised. Oh, she had a, well, when we're back in my shop, back at the house uh, in the garage there, she had a, a what's it, a Dyson um, vacuum cleaner that the plastic broke and it just kind of it was limp. He broke my vacuum cleaner. Mm -hmm. Admit it. Well, the good news is I was trying to vacuum. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So you have to look at the pot. There's two sides of the coin. He broke the vacuum, so I won't let him vacuum anymore. <laughs> but anyway, my point... Yeah, there are two sides. See, the, the point I was attempting to make in this case was, <laughs> was that I was going to... I took that... I, I figured out how to dismantle that vacuum so that it's got all kinds of crazy parts for ray guns and all kinds of things. Oh, sure. yeah. It's got so, wheels, you know. The motor on that thing is only about this big around. I mean, he it, took it apart. Every piece of that machine uh, is you, in you a bucket. You just never know what you're, what you're going to use. You have to save every... That's why when we go back there, I mean, we straightened up our shop for... But you should have seen its working condition before, prior to this. But we have... Too much stuff in a small space, and we could be, and we're adding more all the time. So, mm. yeah, um, it's fascinating on, on taking things apart. When I, when I, uh, I've used old typewriters, old ancient-looking typewriters that are just pretty bad shape that I can get for ten bucks at a, at a flea market, <clears throat> and to, to figure out the process in which to take those apart is challenging. And then you begin to appreciate how much engineering and ingenuity went into these pieces. The mechanics. The mechanics of that. of that, that you have to figure out how to take it apart in a certain sequence. Otherwise, you can't get at certain screws and things. And so, um, I'm, yeah, I got off on a tangent there. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, you had mentioned when you were talking earlier that one of the pieces had um, that you could tell it would be a wobbly. And I'm wa wondering if wobbly is a technical term for something. And oh, are there other. Yeah, terms so the birds that I build that have wheels, um, so they started out as like toys and then. Um, also, you know, living out in the country for 30 years, we're very fond of wildlife and um, the warblers. And it occurred to me that I could make like 10,000 wobblers, yeah. war warblers, you know, and all look different. Well, sometimes you put a little something in one of the tires so that they'd wobble. Well, so it's kind of she. 
she merged the words uh, warbler and wobble with wobblers. Yeah. So three, three times fast. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so if you're if you pull them along a surface, you know the wheels kind of do this, just like the old toys. And um, so I've put jingles in them. That was the other thing about a lot of old toys. You know, they had a little bell with something that makes a little noise. So all the wobblers have bells in them. Oh, so Just much material, so many ideas. You get to a point where it's like there's not enough time. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, that you, you need to start prioritizing things in your mind. Like, I need to do these things before, yeah. you know, because I think I, I feel that way. And yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then we're, we're at a point where we, we're thinking, well, maybe we should finish the, the buildings on our property now. <laughs> 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 maybe we should back off of, because we're running out of space to, uh, we can make our work faster than we can sell them. Usually yeah. we sell them at, show, at, at ex exhibitions and right. we sell some things online, but we can make them, so we've got a backlog and we're using uh, our kids' homes for storage on their walls. And, uh, it's interesting, uh, you know, when we did this show at the Phipps, opened it up last week, uh, we realized that one of our, our son Brett and his wife Amy came out and Mary Ann well, said, we didn't get all of our Valentines from you guys. And they just kind of looked at us like, and we realized mean? at that point, the old saying that possession is nine tenths of the law. <laughs> <laughs> they, uh, yeah. they had it and they were going to hang on to it. <laughs> <laughs> so every year, um, Gary, since he's retired, has been making me valentines that are, you know, heart shaped sculptures. And then I started making ones for him. And then last year when we got these two shows, and they overlap by two weeks, we were thinking, how mm -hmm. can we do this, you know? And I've always wanted to have just a Valentine show. And I asked the Phipps, okay, I have enough Valentines. I probably will sell some of them. Um, we will sell some of them. So I can take her on a exotic trip. Yeah, to, but to, um, in the meantime. <laughs> <laughs> Um, when you um, have a show or whatever, do you ever have um, people coming up and saying, oh, I really like that, but I'd like it a little bit smaller, or I'd like it with a little more green on it or, yeah. or something, and then you have to, then do you make, make it just for their specs, or do you just kind of? Well, in fact, I had someone contact me who had seen the Hopkins show, mm. And um, he wants a commission from some of his dad's memorabilia. Mm. And so um, we've had conversations back and forth, and um, it sounds like it's going to happen. But, yeah. But, but specifically to your point, though, it's pretty impossible to come up with it because of the individual, the one-of-a-kind things that we usually put into it is we can, we can possibly come up with something that's, um, you know, akin to it or has the flavor of it, but we can never really replicate anything. Exactly. So I don't, yeah. that's what I usually would tell people. Yeah. yeah. If they don't like the color, just tell them to buy a different couch, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah it's so funny that people, that's how a lot of, uh, it's hard for us to understand, but that's how a lot of people, that's the um, yeah, kind sure. of a mindset that they, they take. Mm -hmm. We've been speaking with Marianne and Gary Carlson about their ex exhibition, A Confluence of Objects, on view in the Red Penning Gallery at Hopkins Center for the Arts until July 29th, 2023. Thank you so much. Thank Our you. pleasure. Yeah. Our, Our pleasure. pleasure.